Welcome to Choose the Nickel. I'm your host, George Bailey. My co-founder and technical support is the gorgeous Christina Bailey. This podcast is about giving kids financial freedom. We're interviewing fascinating people for their insights about how children learn to be financially savvy. Our guests come from diverse, sometimes conflicting schools of thought, and we love the opportunity to learn from them. We encourage all to weigh our guests' ideas on how to help children thrive, both financially and in general. We invite you to visit our website at www.choosethenickel.com, subscribe to our newsletter, and try out the things we are learning on the podcast. Our next episode features Mike Penny, president of Pinnacle Capital Partners. Mike was born in 1964 in Cyprus and immigrated to Canada in 1977 before becoming a proud Canadian citizen in 1983. He studied at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, obtaining an honors business administration degree with an option in economics and is a designated chartered business valuator and chartered financial analyst. Mike led a remarkable career in the financial services sector before commencing his own self-funded private equity group, Pinnacle Capital Partners, in 2005. He helps companies grow and creates opportunities for others in the areas of pharmaceuticals, software, biomedical instruments, plastics, and gear manufacturing for the wind energy, mining, and hydropower generation industries. He also loves spending time with his wife and their twin daughters. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Penny. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So I'm really excited to uh, have you on the show here. Uh, it's been a little bit since we've spoken, but I want to get a, a refresher on your professional accomplishments. I know a little bit about them, but for the audience's sake, what can you tell me about your greatest professional accomplishments? I think it would be uh, going into business for myself. It's a very tough uh, decision to make to leave a secure job and go into business for yourself and not knowing what the future will hold. I would say that uh, that is my uh, my biggest decision that I made in my life to actually leave a secure, well-paying job. I was a senior uh, member of uh, an accounting firm, a CPA firm, in uh, litigation support and uh, corporate finance. So I left that to start uh, from the beginning my own business. And your own business is Pinnacle Capital Partners. Tell me a little bit about what you guys do. So basically, Pinnacle Capital Partners is a vehicle that we use to conduct deals and to take equity in a number of companies. We're a self-funded private equity group using our own money, and we started with, with very little money. We've been able to successfully invest in a number of companies and grow them, and using the dividends from uh, those successful companies, invest in other companies and grow the portfolio uh, as time goes on. What is your motivation as you start participating in these various companies? What are you trying to achieve? I'm trying to make a not profitable company into a profitable one and looking at what has not been going well in the past and how we can do things better, how we can better serve our customers, uh, provide a win-win scenario for all the parties involved. What has been your biggest success in taking a company that was not profitable and making it profitable? Uh, actually, our first deal was one of our biggest successes, and that was, uh, that was a springboard to our portfolio management of, for our own private equity group, uh, where we took a company that was uh, just at the break-even level, and uh, we were able to help increase the revenue of that company by five times over a four-year period and uh, make it very profitable. Wow. Very cool. Very cool. Have you seen lives changed in the process of doing this? Absolutely. We, we've made uh, many uh, millionaires along the way and seen their lives change from being uh, employees and management of companies into being very successful uh, businessmen running their own businesses. And that's very rewarding We've also seen the headcount in pretty much all of our companies increase by three, four, five times. It's uh, very rewarding when you go into a, a business and you know that you made that happen. You like creating jobs for people. Absolutely. And we also like making money for ourselves. And that's a nice side effect of creating jobs. That's great. Was there anything in your childhood that said, I'm going to grow up to help businesses grow? 
Not so much in those words, but as a child, my dad had a little business. And he worked in the business since uh, I was in kindergarten or since I could walk. And I remember pumping diesel and gasoline into people's vehicles at the age of four or five <laughs> in my home country of Cyprus and uh, handling uh, transactions, taking money, giving back change. In those days, when I was four or five years old, when the other kids were playing uh, outside with their friends and watching TV, I would leave school and go to my dad's business and work till about nine o'clock in the evening, go home, do my homework. He would come home and check me if I did my homework, if I was prepared for the next day, and then go to sleep and go back to school the next day. But uh, in my childhood, I lived through war. In 1974, when Turkey invaded Cyprus, we became refugees in our own home, in our own country. So we had to flee our homes, just like you see now with the Syrian crisis and the Syrian refugees. And we settled in a different part of Cyprus, and we lived in a tent in a Red Cross refugee concentration camp for about three years. And I remember looking around me and thinking, well, it can't get any worse than this. So the future must be bright. Wow. There is a lot to unpack there. Now, I want to get to the refugee story because that is so powerful. But I don't want to pass up the opportunity to talk a little bit about this job that you were doing for your dad while you were a four or five year old. You were filling cars up with gasoline, which makes you think, honestly, Mike, that I need, I need to make more of my kids. You know, we come up to the gas station. Maybe I should trust them to pump a little bit of <laughs> gasoline well, into my car. <laughs> I, 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 I think we baby our kids way too much myself included, we shelter them from the outside world. That prevents them from developing uh, their own uh, skills, their own initiatives and leadership skills. I see it with my own children in that when I was their age, uh, for example, my kids are 11 years old to be 12 next month. At their age, I already had my first job uh, when I was in the refugee camp. I got a job as a painter and I was painting houses in grade five. Here they are, they're 12 years old, and you ask them to make their bed, and it's like the whole world's over. Wow. And so, you know, I, I think at any time when you were filling gas, you know, did that ever feel weird? Did you ever feel afraid of the other big people coming around you? No, no. We, uh, we live in a small village of a 1,000 people. We feel really safe. There's no crime to speak of. And filling gas, filling gas was just part of the job. I would work in, I was a grocery store. It was a co-op. So we sold everything from construction supplies to medical supplies to eyeglasses to prescription drugs to gasoline, agricultural supplies, pesticides, the whole, the whole thing. My job was basically to serve customers at the front desk when somebody came by the gas station, just run out and fill the gas, get the money, come back in and continue working. So it felt quite, it felt quite normal. I wish I was paid more when I was a kid because I always complained to my dad that, you know, hey, Everybody gets paid except for me here. <laughs> so wait, wait, wait. You were not getting paid. You were just kind of part of the family business. Exactly. You know, the year when we met with the accountants, I would be in the meetings when I was younger. They would always comment how low my dad's labor costs were. And I would spike up and say, <laughs> because I don't get paid. <laughs> of course paid they're low. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And then, and then he would respond, what do you mean you don't get paid? I said, did you pay me? He goes, don't you eat? Oh, <laughs> <guess> man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's tempting, of course, to want to hold that over my own children forever. You know, hey, you eat, you breathe, you know, give, give you a bed to sleep. But, you know, I, I'm kind of on your side. You know, as a kid, I kind of I, I like to be able to make sure that my kids get a little bit of pay, not necessarily for household chores, but man, if they're filling the car with gas and they're, you know, banding down the store, uh, that's that's definitely worth pay, Mike. I think you got robbed. I, I, th I think so, too. And to this day, to this day I, uh, I tell my dad, you know, like he, he talks about uh, how efficient his store was and how <laughs> how. Uh, how profitable it was. And I said, because he paid nobody. I worked there. My mother worked. My, my older brother worked. My little sister was in a creep uh, at the side of the, of the show, you know, by of the cashier. And she didn't get to work because she was too young. Well, and she had, she had uh, like a, a charm yeah. tactic. You know, yeah, you, yeah. you always have to have like, you know, the big fuzzy mascot at your gas station to make people happy. She was the little, you know, sweet mascot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's doing her part. You oh, know? yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's classic. Now, you said that you were actually handling money at yes. this point. Uh, yes. did, w- what was that like? I mean, did that make you feel grown up? Uh, did you ever feel tempted to swipe a little on the side? I mean, what was that like? You, you, feel, you feel grown up and you're given a responsibility. We would reconcile the – that has very strict accounting control. So we would reconcile everything uh, at the end of the day. Mm. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, exactly how many liters you sold, how much you collected, and it would reconcile. And boy, at the end of the day, it was I was nervous all the time making sure that things reconciled with the tapes and uh, and we had no credit cards and there's no checks. In those days in Cyprus, there was no checks. It was all strictly cash. So at the end of the day, it would reconcile every day and, the, and then the cash would go in the safe in the business. So he felt grown up. As far as uh, swiping money, there wasn't that need or that want because we were raised in a society that was not materialistic at all. We basically had that one pair of pants where my mother would wash it, would be wearing our pajamas type of thing, or wear our shorts. And it was warm weather, so we would wear pretty much shorts all the time. We weren't exposed to commercials that would make all these wants come up. So all we had was, uh, was a soccer ball and we kicked it around and we're happy. We're happy when you have a soccer ball, right? There's nowhere to spend the money either, right? So there wasn't that need to have money other than just take it and go buy an ice cream from my dad's competitors down the street. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> take that, dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Free labor. I'm getting my ice cream wherever I will, please. All right. I like that. On that same note, do you feel that having those opportunities to be mature affected your later propensity to be honest absolutely i think i think uh, your uh, your character is formed at a very young age whether it's honesty or the work ethic it's something that you learn i don't think it's something that you're born with and your experiences in life they they really do shape you in your adult life as well and it's also relationship management you you have to always deal with people i remember a story when i was a kid and that um, it was just when uh, tape cassette recorders came out, but we were selling radios, just radios, but our competitors were selling cassette tape recorders. But we had our loyal clientele that would always come and shop from us. So this gentleman came and he asked to get a radio, not knowing that what a cassette tape recorder was. These are the early days. So he asked my dad if it plays a certain song. And my dad said, of course, it plays everything, including this song. He goes, yeah, of course. So he takes the, uh, the radio, and then his, this guy's neighbor had bought a tape recorder, and he was playing that popular song over and over again. This guy comes back, and he brings back the radio in pieces, and he says, <laughs> your radio would not play that song. And my neighbors was playing it all day long. So I took me, I threw it against the wall. So he came back, and he wanted his money back. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because our product was inferior in that it would not obey his commands to play that song. So you have to exercise relationship management. So you build those skills early on, right? Yes, absolutely. Oh, man. Now, as a kid, and sometimes this happens where kids understand technology better than their elders. Did you know what was going on? Or were you just kind of thinking like, you know, gee, golly, dad, you know, it doesn't play that song. I I think the guy kind of has a point. (laughs) Well, I, I didn't understand technology back then. Keep in mind that TVs were just introduced in Cyprus at that time, and TV was from uh, 6 o'clock till 10 o'clock, and we were the first people in the neighborhood that had a TV even, a black and white TV, and the whole neighborhood would come over to watch the news at our house, everyone sitting on the floor because you had a TV. Those were the early days. I just watched my dad try to negotiate his way out of this dilemma with this gentleman. Years later, when you go back to Cyprus, my dad met with, you know, we see them, right? And we just laugh over this uh, this incident. <laughs> That's good. It's great to know that that gentleman had a good sense of humor. And I think that it's wonderful that you had exposure to this community where everybody knows your name. It seemed like it was a very tight place to live. Yes, yes. But, you know, the world's a small place. And even though we live in North America, still, you know, your reputation and your credentials, your honesty – they go a long way, especially in today's age with technology and being able to Google someone's name and look them up on LinkedIn or even look them up on Facebook. You get a taste of what somebody is like 
and everybody knows everything about everybody and the information is at the, at the touch of their fingertips. It's a very small world even today in today's age and technology has made that even smaller. At least on a superficial sense, I think that you're right, that we at least get a style for, you know, okay, this guy's a clown, this guy's, you know, he's very serious, this guy's a scholar, you know, and maybe we have a few evaluations that let us know whether this person can be trusted. But I I do think that there is something to say about that face-to-face contact and what that does for the relationship, particularly in business. Absolutely. And the small community makes that easy because you know your neighbors, you know everybody, you know the community, whether it's at church, at school, you have that opportunity. Let's fast forward just a bit. You mentioned that in the early 70s, there was war breaking out in your region and that you became a refugee. Can you give me a little bit of background, particularly for those of us who are not as familiar with the history of what was going on in Cyprus at that time? Yeah. So Turkey invaded in uh, 1974. They took one third of the island, and as they were advancing, it was a very ugly picture in that people were, if you're a man, you're killed. If you're a woman, you're raped. My dad was actually on the front lines. The Turkish uh, troops broke through the front lines. Everybody just uh, came back to their villages. Uh, Keep in mind that my dad was not a soldier. He was a businessman, and uh, everybody was conscripted to go fight at the front lines. So he came back, and uh, we had a pickup truck, and we basically loaded the whole uh, neighborhood on standing room only at the back of the pickup truck, and we kept driving the the opposite direction from where the shelling was and the and the fighting. We didn't know how far to go, so we stopped after about uh, forty about thirty minutes of driving, and we stayed underneath. Uh, we slept under trees for about a month, not knowing. And we took some supplies from the store with us, like spam and uh, bread and just some some food supplies until we heard that the Turkish troop advancement stood at a certain point in, the, in a safe area. And then at that time, families were, were divided and they were looking for their loved ones. So we had the radio on and we heard our name and my mother's family that lived in the mountains, they were saying, if you're alive, uh, can you please communicate with your family at this phone number, right? And back then there was no phones in each in people's houses. It was a central village phone that you would call to and they'll run to notify your who you want to speak to in the village and bring them to the center of the village so that you can have a conversation. So uh, they were safe and then we we went up to meet them on the mountains. We were unified with uh, the whole family. After that, we had to have a place to, to live, right? We spent uh, about a few months at, uh, at my uncle's garage and there was two families there in, the, in a one-room garage for about six months. And then we they started setting up these refugee concentration camps and then we moved into this refugee concentration camp for the next, uh, until 1977 when my uncle sponsored us to uh, come to uh, Canada. My mother's brother was in Canada working since 1972 and they sponsored us to move to Canada. About how old were you when all of this was happening? So I was 10 when the war happened and I was 13 when it came to Canada and I still remember the days of the Red Cross truck coming with the food and basically go with your refugee card, which I still have. We show you your refugee card and it says there's uh, five members in your family. So based on that, they give you so much uh, oil, so much flour, so much rice. And that's enough for you to cook and, and get through that week. Because imagine having half the population of the U.S. being homeless, displaced overnight. There's no way to accommodate so many people in housing so we, they set up all these uh, tents side by side. There's washrooms every half a kilometer that were public washrooms. You had to walk there for the washroom and shower and so on, right? It was a big change, but I think it, was, it affected my parents more because they lost their business, they lost their house, they lost everything, right? And they had to start basically from the beginning again. Now, your dad was an entrepreneur before yes. all of this. Yes. And in a lot of a way, ways, I'm sure that he affected your entrepreneurial spirit. As you were living in these camps, did that entrepreneurial spirit ever manifest itself? Yes. Actually, when we were living in the camp, I learned how to make kites. I would make these kites made of bamboo sticks. So basically, you take a bamboo stick, split it in half, and you take three halves, and you put them together, and you tie them, and you make a kite with uh, bamboo sticks and, uh, and paper, and because you had no access to glue, 
you would steal some of my mom's flour and mix it with water and, and use it for glue for the, for the kites. And I was pretty good at it. So fairly quickly, some of the kids in the neighborhood wanted to, me to build them kites. So I would build these kites and then I would start charging for these kites. And then I would, and then of course, as they fly them, they get damaged. They, they get stuck in the wires and they need repairing. So then I would offer like a warranty on these kites. A, a and, warranty on kites. A warranty. I would give, <laughs> I would I give like. I didn't know what a warranty was when I was like 25, you know? <laughs> It was, it was like wow. it was like in today's world. It was like a service agreement that uh, you know you buy from me, and I will service your kite for this this four week period type of thing, right? Mike and, Peña uh, knows how to take care of his customers. That's great. Exactly. <laughs> so it it comes down to to keeping your customer happy, right, and servicing the client because if you don't, somebody else will. Yes. And, and I learned those lessons early on, right? Did okay. Wait, wait. You learned those lessons early. You did at the shop, and, and and I could hear that. Were there ever any other competitors who rose up in the ranks of the refugee camps in the kite business? Yes, there was a few. There were here and there that would make kites, and uh, they would sell one off type of thing. But I had the production line, and I had regular customers. So so that was uh, that was that was a lot of fun actually, and I enjoyed it. It didn't take long to repair someone's kite and uh, make it fly again. So it was actually a lot of fun. Wow. Uh, that's very impressive. I keep on thinking that you had these moments when you got to meet with your father and his accountant. Were there any lessons that you were learning in those meetings that was fueling this honestly quite mature understanding of how business is done? There was a lot of discussion during those meetings about uh, checks and balances and how you're how to be on top of things, right? Whether it's managing your cash flow, managing your costs. Uh, of course, his costs were very low because he wasn't paying us, but it all brings together some form of structure which uh, you can use in any business today. That you need structure, you need checks and balances, you need to control your costs, right? As I got older, I began to understand those concepts a lot more, especially going through business school. You begin to understand that what was in practice back then, there's actually a theory behind it and there's more in-depth theory and, and how to better apply and improve financial performance. Let's bring you up to Canada. You say that you arrived in Canada. Uh, was that in the Ontario area? Yes, we arrived in Kitchener, Ontario because my uncle, he lived here. We stayed with my uncle for about a month until uh, we were able to get our own place. And my dad got a job. I came on a Wednesday. I think it was July the 9th, uh, 1977. I think it was a Wednesday. It might have been a Tuesday. I'm not sure. But by Friday, he had gotten his first job. My uncle worked for uh, Frito-Lay. And knowing that my dad would be coming over and we're waiting to get our visa, he went to his manager and said, my brother-in-law will be coming over and I need to get a job. So a job came up right, uh, right away. And he worked both shifts in order to keep my dad, his position open when he came from Cyprus. When he came here, he went for an interview with frito -Lay. He got the job and he worked there until he retired. That's very impressive that your uncle had so much care that he wanted to make sure that, you know, your dad would have a place. Yeah, and he worked two shifts for almost a year until my dad got our papers to be able to come out. So he came over as economic migrants, even though we were refugees in Cyprus when Canada accepted 800 families of refugee families when the war happened, but um, the people that got to come through were, for the most part, non-refugees, people that had contacts. The people that needed it, they didn't have access to that. So we, it took us about uh, three, three years to go through the, the immigration process to be vetted, to see if you had the skills that Canada needed. In my dad's first interview with the Consul General of Canada that flew from Israel to meet us, they asked him what he did for, for a living. And my dad said that he had his own business. But the response from the, the Consul General was that, well, Canada does not need entrepreneurs. We need trades. So then we, we went back to the, to the drawing table. And my dad remembered that in his uh, youth, he worked for the British Army in uh, Cyprus as a tailor. So he would be mending uh, uniforms for the British Army in the British bases. So he took a chance and went back to the British Army and lo and behold, his, uh, his boss from 1958 was still working there. He gave us a recommendation and accreditation that he did work in the British Army and he was a good tailor. So he applied as a tailor. 
So then in order to come to Canada, we needed to find a job for him before he came. So my, my uncle had a friend who was a tailor. His name is George. George was a tailor, had his own tailor shop. And he basically guaranteed my dad a job when he came to Canada. And my mom, who was a seamstress, when he came to Canada. When he came over, we met with George. And George said, well, as a tailor, it's a dying, it's a dying profession. There's not much money. If you can't find anything else, come and work with me. But it doesn't pay the same amount of money as it pays to work in a, in a factory. And back in those days with unionization, factories paid well. Long story forward, George is now my tailor. And uh, he made my custom suits, my custom pants, and he's a wonderful guy. And we still talk about the day when he sent us the letter with the guarantee of a job for my dad when we lived in the refugee camp. And he was over here. So George is a British-trained tailor and uh, actually did some work for Buckingham Palace when he was in Britain and got his own uh, shop here in Ontario called the Tailor Shop. He's my tailor now. So we always talk about the story when he sponsored us, when he guaranteed my dad a job. That is so sweet. I love that. And he's 80, I think he's 83 years old now, and he's still working. Wow. That's great. That's great. What a, what terrific examples to have in your life. Yes. When you went back to Ontario now to work and you're at the age of 13, did you pick up where you'd left off making kites? Not necessarily kites, but something else. Did you have that fire in you? The fire dies when you change environments and you come to a place with a different culture, a different language. All of a sudden, you don't have the, the comfort in, uh, for example, in the language. We didn't speak English when it came over. You lose your circle, especially in those years. So that entrepreneurial spirit kind of dies because you don't have the confidence level. And to be an entrepreneur, it stems from having confidence in yourself. So when I was 13, we came to Canada. I went to school, I finished grade 7 in Cyprus, and I started here in grade 8 without the language. So the focus then was more on learning English, doing well academically, and being able to achieve higher education, because that was one of the main reasons why we came to Canada, for a better future, right? And without education, you can't get there. So when it came to Canada, I was spending a lot of time in the library, uh, working with my Greek-English dictionary to get through my homework which took maybe four times as long as other kids because I had to translate things from English to Greek, do my work in Greek, and translate back into English, especially in the early days. School was, it became the main focus. There's no room for being an entrepreneur or doing anything on that. I did get a paper route in grade eight. That was very nice, but it took a while before I became comfortable again with the, with the language and being able to speak so you're understood and develop your uh, network, so to speak. When would you say you regained that sense? What what experience? Was it when you were 17, 18, 19, after college? It came later, later in life, because even though we went through school and you go from being an A student to being a, a B minus student because of the language, eventually the marks did come up because the language became better. You develop more confidence. And in university, I founded the accounting association that's in place now at Wilfrid Laurier University. I did that in nine, I co-founded that in 1983 with a few other classmates. So that was my first taste of doing something I, I wanted to do and I enjoyed again. I graduated in business school and joined a CPA firm. That was fun because I was doing it on my own, but my real, uh, where I was able to spread my wings is uh, when I, I became involved in the local community here in Kitchener, in what you call the Greek Cypriot community. So I incorporated a company called the Greek Cypriot community to bring all the people from Cyprus together. And we fundraised both from the members, but also from local businesses. We uh, raised money and we purchased our own building. We had about 400 families from Cyprus here in Kitchener. And it was a big accomplishment for us to be as refugees to now have our own home for the community here in Canada. And it really brought the community together, but it also gave me the chance to use my skills, to develop my skills, whether it's time, ma time management, relationship management skills, cash flow management skills, to make this community come together and see it all happen. That was where I first uh, began to see the potential in doing something you love to do. And at the end of the day, you need to be passionate about what you do, 
money will take care of itself eventually, but you need to love what you do and be the best you can be and be passionate. Find your passion. Now, having had all of those experiences, both wonderful and challenging, and I'm sure it's sometimes painful, do you have any advice for today's parents? I think today's parents need to need to let the kids be live in a in a less structured environment and allow them to be themselves and get them involved in volunteer work. Because in volunteer work, that's where you get the the opportunity to be exposed to a lot of um, factors that you wouldn't be otherwise exposed. Whether it's volunteering at your church or in your school or school council or even at the food bank, it's about giving back. It feels good when you give back. And not only does it feel good, but it also allows you to develop skills. For example, if you're in your church group, if you're working, if you're volunteering there, you're going to get to meet older people who are most likely professionals. And you start building your your little network early on in life. It lets you think for yourself and think out, think outside the box. So I think the kids today need a bit more freedom, actually a lot more freedom, to be able to be themselves and uh, and find themselves. I find that in today's structured environment, and we're guilty of it too in our own home, it's just a bit too structured sometimes. They have piano lessons every day on this day, and they have swimming lessons on this day, and they have violin lessons, and they have soccer games. And so every day is taken up with something, and the kids don't, don't get a chance to be kids, so to speak. And then you have the electronics, which really rob a lot of the time from children, which we didn't have when we were children. So there's so many things that demand children's attention these days. It's our job as a parent not to manage it, but to try and give the kids as much free time as possible and decrease these demands for their attention by their environment, whether it's electronics, extracurricular activities, and so on. I mean, they're all good, but at, at some point, it becomes too, too structured. And the kids need some time that's not structured that they can actually develop themselves. I really appreciate your wisdom and your stories. I have one last question for you, and that is, what is your very favorite charitable cause? So my very favorite charitable cause is an institution here in, in Waterloo, and it is called the Perimeter Institute of Theoretical Physics. And it's a think tank for theoretical physics that was started by the founder of BlackBerry, who is from Waterloo, Mike Lazaridis. It's about exploring what's out there. And it's, it's about theoretical physics. They have some of the brightest minds in the world in Waterloo dealing with the exploration of black holes, stars, the start of the universe. And I find it just fascinating about what is out there and about the unknown. That is my favorite institution I, li I like to support. It's funny because I think to myself, you know, normally when someone talks about a charitable cause, there's always a way that makes it feel accessible, like maybe the children's hospital or something like that. I can volunteer. I can go read to the kids. But if I volunteer for a physics institute, I feel like my mind's already blown walking in there. I'm like, you know, what do you do? <laughs> but, you, but you like physics then. And do you find yourself studying that on the side? Is that a, a hobby? Yes, I like to read a lot about physics. See, when I was going through, when I was going through my education, I wanted to be a scientist. And all of my ah. high school courses were in science, and I wanted to be a doctor. My brother wanted to be a doctor too, and it's every immigrant's dream that their kids become doctors. But uh, he was about uh, three years ahead of me, and he wasn't doing very good in university. When he went to university, he went from being uh, maybe a bit too controlled at home to having all the freedom of living in residence. And of course, uh, the drinking and the girls, they took away his attention. So he wasn't going to get into med school. So I was looking at myself and thinking, well, and he actually graduated. And he did not have a job in 1982 when uh, the recession was here in North America. So I was thinking that, do I really want to go through school and graduate and be unemployed? And I did not want to do that. So I decided to be near money. I figured if I am near money, I'll be able to make money and I'll be able to understand the financial concepts better because all through high school, I wanted to be, we took all the science courses, the chemistry, biology, physics, math. In fact, I, I didn't have a chance to take any, uh, any business courses when I was in high school. So even after having applied to university for uh, science, I changed my major to go into business 
having not taken any business courses in my whole life. So it was a bit of an unknown, but I just wanted to be able to support my family when I graduated and, and have a job. But I still have the love for uh, science and the physics, and uh, I read a lot of books about physics on my own time. But I don't think I'll make any money being a physicist. <laughs> although, yeah. although we do own companies that, that relate to physics. For example, one of our companies is in uh, digital imaging for uh, cancer diagnosis. And we're in uh, some of the most renowned institutions in the U.S., for example, Cold Spring Harbor, MD Anderson in the U.S., the James Cancer Center in Ohio. So we make a digital scanner and it involves physics. Yeah. And our employees are, for the most part, PhDs in physics or computer science. And the founder was one of the top physics professor at the University of Waterloo. So even though I did, I did not become a physicist myself, I do own engineering companies, of course, med companies in clinical trials, developing uh, drugs by testing on human beings, which are the clinic in St. Charles, Missouri and Toronto. So in my professional career, in my, in my investments, I do have a lot of investments in the science field, but uh, I like to also look at it from a business perspective as well. That is excellent. Well, Mike, I have really enjoyed talking to you. I've really enjoyed your story, and I appreciate your coming on the show. Thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to seeing you, George, when I'm in, uh, in St. Louis next time. Please do. It would be great, okay? I will. Thank you. Have a great day. Likewise. Everybody else, thank you for listening. We hoped you enjoyed the interview and found useful ideas about things you can do with your kids. Be sure to check the show notes at www.choosethenickel.com for links to names, books, and other resources we discussed in today's show. Also, please subscribe to our newsletter and visit our contact page where you can give us feedback. We invite you to share Choose the Nickel with your friends and join us in our quest to give kids financial freedom. 